Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, an event that was organized, which was really to catalyze um, a larger network. Um, and it was organized by myself and Andre Kiert, who's the chair for the critical studies of the transformation of higher, edu uh, higher education transformation. Um, you can search the acronym at some point. Um, <laughs> um, he was here in May. Um, I think Adriana and Tony were there. Um, and he, he offered a, an analysis of some of the student protests around the world um, and, and what they may be signifying. But um, we really both felt that it was important um, in terms of, of our own journeys and affordances and um, those of a number of different people in different places in the world to stop um, a gather together and really question in what ways we're wanting to um, shame, shape and form this area of scholarship or contribute to it or deviate from it. Um, and so we particularly framed it in terms of this idea of emancipatory imaginations. Um, this is the concept note, um, which I think I've got on the tables for you. Um, so Andre and I corresponded for, for some time about the issue of higher education transformation um, and then came up with this concept note which you can see very much tries to assert this question of suspension, suspending interpretive frames to um, think of the ways in which we want to contribute to the idea of higher education and what sort of imaginary is necessary to de destabilize it for a future possibility. Um, so what was important was the suspension of the interpretive lenses that people brought, both as academics and practitioners. There was quite a mix of people from different parts of the world and from different functions of the university and even larger than that, the sort of macro curriculum of government roles and that sort of thing. Um, and what it required in a way was a quite a high degree of trust from the people who were there. Almost all felt positioned as having a critical orientation in their work. But because of bringing together so many different people from different places and different lenses, it does require trust to say to people, can you suspend it for a while? Um, I think that um, my sense is that many people were sitting in a similar position to Andre and I where we began almost to feel um, a sense of, of disbelief about the possibilities. Um, the, we're both from the South African context and there have been many, many, we're not going to talk about it I think too much, foregrounded too much because this is larger than South Africa, but in that country there have been very, very concerted and explicit ways in which to try and um, create change within the academy, both from the top down in terms of putting in vice chancellors, um, large policies, um, centers, and then from the bottom up. Um, it's been a very big project of the transformation of the country. Um, but with that comes this almost a sense of, is it actually, is it happening? Um, and I think that my sense is you almost need that, that, that moment in people's thinking and that's when they're, they're willing to perhaps suspend for a while the traditions that they are built on to hear and see, well, then what actually can be done in time. So, um, Andre's, oh, there's the picture. Oh. <laughs> that was some of us right at the end. Um, there was a much larger group, and we just forgot to photograph the whole bunch together. Um, you'll see Tony and I literally in the center. Um, so there were people, yeah, from all over the world, and... Um, it was, it was really an honor to be interacting with these people. Um, what, what is amazing is that Andre has a really nice team around him, of, of which Jenny is the leader for this project. Um, and so what we're going to do now in, in the little bit of time that we have available is to try to almost take you through the experience of what it was like at the event, where it was begun with a sort of review of critical university studies to try to give a sense of its limitations. Mm -hmm. And then what followed on were a series of round tables for two days with provocative sort of Socratic questioning where people made contributions and then a tiny break for people to just breathe <laughs> and then a return to a much smaller group who, who formed sort of working groups to try to 
um, a tech issues of how would it be extended across Africa, across other spaces in the world, and what sort of impact would it have? So, um, yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I just want to run through, and I'll do a very condensed version of it. Um, my colleague Luan put together this review of critical diversity studies, basically. Um, he describes it as, as a study of the particular diversity and the universal diversity, um, looking at the past, the present, and futures as concept, institution, and process. And as he points out, it draws on various critical fields of inquiry. And so one of the things that came out is that critical university studies very interdisciplinary, um, and people are sort of coming at from all sorts of different angles. And so there's not really um, sort of one unified way of, of approaching it. Um, the term was apparently coined by Jeffrey Williams in a paper in 2012. Um, arguing that this field sort of emerged in the 1990s as scholars began to realize what was happening in higher education. Largely the, the changes, I suppose, neoliberal changes of massification um, and things like that, and I suppose movements away from sort of this public institution idea and more focus on like a corporatized kind of university. And that's where you see the, the most of um, <coughs> the more institutionalized critical university studies stuff that has come out. We have a Palgrave Macmillan series, one from John Hopkins, and then this Bergen Press. Um, and most of the, a lot of the titles, for example, foreground either like ideas of this kind of crisis in, in the in university institutions, specifically around neoliberalism. Um, so that's generally the focus. Um, there are sort of other aspects more, again, but again it comes back to the idea of labor in this journal, um, and, and this one focused on pedagogies. And then there's some hubs kind of emerging. Um, the top one, I think Dina is involved. Tom, yeah. yeah. Um, that's in the UK, and there's a Danish university actual unit for critical university studies. And in the US, which is, I think, the dominant, um, the place where critical university studies is most established, they even have a research track. Um, and these are some of the, the, the main themes. So you can see very much this focus on things related to sort of neoliberalism, the, such as privatization, labor, globalization, innovation. Um, and all of these kind of themes, though, do link back to sort of this fundamental question of what is the function of the university. So um, I think Chris Brunk in his book, I think it's The Soul of the University, asks kind of what, what are universities for kind of thing. So this kind of underlying almost existential question or of what are universities really supposed to be doing. Um, However, I think it's a Heather Steffens article points out that there is a history of, like a, almost an alternative history of um, critical university studies, if you want to call it that, such as um, Paulo Freire and Adrian Rich. Um, and there are other kinds of angles on critical university studies, such as here on this, the Southern quote, Critical University Studies puts a name on something that activists, intellectuals, and scholars of African American studies, women's studies, and ethnic studies have been doing for decades and even centuries. Um, so I think that's almost like these two trajectories, this very sort of institutionalized one that kind of has this name, Critical University Studies, and then sort of this longer tradition that hasn't been named as such before. Um, for example, this Weinberg College has this program in critical theory that has a lot of um, sort of resources just there. So then the issues of decolonization come out strongly, for example. Um, and obviously coming from a South African background, the issues of decolonization, Africanization, issues of race, gender, those are very strongly um, foregrounded in how we approach higher education, I suppose. Um, and in our, okay, that's just some buying ontologies of kind of how people have conceptualized university. So when we came to doing the, this, the, this winter school, I suppose the thing was to almost take a critical stance on critical university studies as it has been sort of in the mainstream. And so we, you can see there's, these are basically the different round tables that we had. These were the, the, the Socratic questions or the prompts or whatever. Um, 
and many of them focus on this idea of reimagination of the university so that comes out very strong in the concept note. Um, and then also trying to touch on these different kind of contestations within critical university studies itself. For example, um, links to, for example, the SDGs. Yeah. I mean that. Yeah, I think that that second one particularly was because it hasn't been a central part of critical university studies mm -hmm. engagement, and that um, there's been a, often a separation between those from development studies and because they look at the global south from mm -hmm. the global north perspective, mm -hmm. and then looking at university studies in a different way. So it was trying, in a sense, to bring the two in proximity. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely that third point, yeah. um, which is sort of asking, ca is there a sense of, of this field and can it extend across mm. um, these sort of largely mapped areas, you know, um, mm. and we're using these global north and global south knowing that they're like really flawed yeah. <laughs> this concept. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, and the other thing that came out was this idea of the, the African university, because the one idea was to try and create an African critical university studies almost of its own, although that is a quite a complex idea. And so that was kind of this question of what does African mean? And I mean, there's so many different contestations just as a geographical thing, as a cultural thing, um, as a form of like solidarity, but also um, like a problematic term and identification in of itself that comes very much from the West and the colonial imagina imagination. And one of our contributors, Amos Njuguna, um, he sort of suggested that African should be an ideology or a, a philosophy even that could then be transferred to other contexts potentially. So that was really interesting. And then like the last one was trying to um, foreground those I suppose blind spots in a such as gender and race, sexuality, um, per disability, those things that sort of seem to have slipped through the cracks of this critical university studies as it was sort of institutionalized. Anything else you want to add on that? Mm -mm. So that was the, the round tables, which is very more like almost like a theoretical exploration of the different ideas around the school. And then we had the workshops, which were then meant to be more pragmatic, um, looking at how do we then build this network that we want to kind of establish um, for these kind of different productive relationships. Um, so both an African on the African continent and then across continents more broadly, especially in the global south. Um, the other important thing was to link it to policy and practice, um, which has actually been quite a big thing in higher education studies, but then to potentially integrate that into a more critical um, perspective. And then the question of pathways to impact, and in South Africa we don't talk about pathways to impact, it's a seems to be a UK kind of term. <laughs> yeah, so um, partly because of how this workshop was funded and also because I suppose the idea of Pathways to Impact is quite good in that you, you're kind of wanting to go beyond the ivory tower and actually have a meaningful impact, like more like what Naomi's doing. Um, so that was also part of that discussion. Um, I think, yeah. I don't know if Tony wants to reflect first or... Yeah. What, what um, um, we have to think of, I remember being fascinated participating in the seminar and been thinking a lot about it ever since. Um, and uh, I don't have any sort of well worked out coherent sort of position. Uh, just it was part of a number of observations but also trying to connect it to the work that I am involved with in, in different, different contexts. Um, one of the things that was striking, it struck me fairly quickly at the seminar was that uh, a large part of the discussion didn't seem to be about critical university studies, it seemed to be about the heart and soul of South Africa. Uh, I was very struck at the, um, the huge depth of anger among young African scholars and the huge debate there was between younger and older generations about the rate of change or the, 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 the slow rate of change. There were some of the sessions where that debate um, just took over the discussion and uh, I don't know how any other people from outside South Africa felt but um, I felt sort of sitting 
John jaw drop in wonder at what had what had gone wrong um, and why there was such an intense debate about the um, slow rate of change in the country. Then Dina took us to visit uh, Macanda in Grahamstown and we visited some schools and you began to realise <laughs> why there's the depths of anger because the, uh, the inequalities between the schools were absolutely appalling. Uh, the, uh, on one level, that shouldn't have been a surprise, I suppose, because I've been in South Africa a number of times, and I remember 20 years ago um, uh, uh, going into um, some of the townships around uh, uh, Johannesburg and being shocked at the sort of conditions. Um, on a later visit, I um, uh, engaged with Kader Ashma uh, when he was Minister of uh, Water, because uh, he had been the anti-apartheid leader in, in Ireland for many years in exile. Um, and at that stage, there seemed to be some evidence of some progress. But on this visit, I was shocked and horrified at how that seemed to have stalled, because the levels of inequalities just remained just huge, much, much wider than I expected. Um, then, coming back, I've read since uh, a book about um, someone who was sent in to clean up Port Elizabeth, where the conference was held, because of the corruption in the local public authorities, uh, and uncovered uh, an unbelievable sea of corruption uh, and failed to deal with it, because the, uh, the, the people who were corrupt were too powerful, um, and the whole situation. So, so there's a whole big issue around some of the local politics, and that was interesting for me because a lot of this, these related or comparable issues here in Northern Ireland also were to do with simple local politics rather than grand theoretical concerns. So I said earlier one of the issues that I had worked on in you know, sort of previous life was around patterns of participation and progress in higher education here in Northern Ireland. And there was a body of work done around that time for a human rights body where basically, to cut a long story short, we uncovered there were two, two things that were uncovered. Uh, one was that there had been systematic underfunding of Catholic schools uh, for a generation. Uh, and that helped explain why leavers from Catholic schools had lower qualifications on average than leavers from Protestant or state schools. Um, uh, and that was changed. Uh, whenever the data were released, uh, and there was a huge public debate, that was changed. Uh, the other element that came up in this was that within Queen's, within the university, there had uh, been a, a pattern of informal processes for recruitment and promotion of staff, which meant there were very few Catholics employed, and the few Catholics who were employed found it virtually impossible to get promoted. And that was changed by formalising the recruitment and promotion processes. So now, if we have a problem, in fact, that there are too many Catholics in senior positions, <laughs> and in some sense, there's a whole lot of, sort of dynamics around that. So in some sense, so th there's a sort of a pragmatism which has always driven me. Where there's a problem, rather than worrying about fitting it within a theoretical frame, and do something about it and change it and make it better, uh, because in, in many circumstances you can actually you can actually do that. Uh, one of the things that came up in the discussion that I was in, in the seminar that I was very critical of was the use of the, the term neoliberalism. Um, I thought uh, it's partly because I think the, the term is used in a way too promiscuous sense to uh, as it able to say something that's bad without sort of identifying what its badness is actually all about. Uh, you, sir, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Because uh, even in sort of the, the, the presentation, the, or some of the discussions, sometimes new, the advent of neoliberalism was attached as a consequence of the end of the Cold War. Uh, in fact, if you look at the economic policy, neoliberalism came into place in the 1970s after the, the oil crash. Um, but even the term neoliberalism is used to cover a huge, huge range of economic approaches from the sort of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Chicago school uh, gangsters who went in and laid waste to Chile as part of a, a, an entirely neoliberal new economic policy, right through to the social market, which was proposed under New Labour in an attempt to try and uh, deal with the, um, uh, recognise that the role of the state is to accept in the dynamics of a, of a capitalist market there will be inequalities, but the role of the state is to maintain those inequalities within certain levels and to sort of a, uh, uh, and to keep sort of control that sort of way, rather than the demand management that it happened beforehand uh, during the Keynesian period. And one of the things that's that's absent in a lot of the use of the term neoliberalism as a critique is uh, an account of what things were like before neoliberalism, uh, because the uh, the 
one of the things, this comes back to the point uh, Dana made about nostalgia, one of the things that often I find frustrated, frustrated when people are talking about higher education, they hark back to those glory days in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, whenever people could go to university, could do what they wanted, they got public money to do it, uh, everyone was well paid, everyone had a very comfortable existence, nobody had to work too hard, um, uh, and they longed for the days whenever life was like that. Uh, but those were the days when 8% of the population went to universities. The analogy for the institution was the, the English private school. Um, where you were funded by everyone else to go and have a good time for three or four years before you went on to take on a leading role in society somewhere. There is nothing to be nostalgic about in those sorts of institutions. Uh, so for me, the sort of the, the key issue, and this is where we're starting to connect it to this, this things that I've been involved with in the Council of Europe and the and this sort of broader uh, sort of global network, is the it's all to do with the purpose of higher education, what it's for, because one historic debate around higher education institutions was whether uh, it it had the right to be separate from society. And the people in it could have a, literally have a cloistered experience, not having to worry too much about what was going on in the world around, because their thoughts were on grander and bigger and greater things. Uh, even though most of the people, of the small number of people who were in that little cloistered community, were quite affluent males. Um, and they shared a very common world view. Um, and there was never any dissent or, or criticism, because everyone thought the same sort of way. Uh, so th there's no nostalgia for that, that, particular, that particular period. Um, minorities were by and large excluded uh, in sort of most terms. Um, the, so the, the, the question then, the first question is, should the university be engaged in society or not? And, and I, my personal view on this is very clear, that it should be engaged. This actually even came up when you talk about pathways to impact. The debate around impact in UK higher education uh, is essentially driven by a, a government uh, attempt to try and ensure that public investment in higher education research uh, leads to some benefit to society. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's you know the the, the government is largely got an economic uh, economic agenda in mind, but that's. That's not the only sort of notion of, of impact. There was an argument by some academics at the time that this was an outrageous assault on academic freedom and that universities and academics should be funded publicly to do what they wanted with no system for accountability. And I have to say, that seems to me just a modern version of the cloistered university, and I don't, I'm not comfortable with that position at all. But just because you accept that there has to be some point uh, uh, some public value to higher education, then there's a much bigger debate about what that public, public, pu public value is. Uh, because if you look at what's been happening in the West, uh, where the level of engagement has got higher and the public, the public engagement of universities has got higher, a lot of this is focused on economic priorities uh, and urban linked into urban regeneration strategies. Very quickly on this point about the, part of the value of the engagement strategy in the UK is that it, it highlights the social role and the social mission of universities. So there's a lot to be debated around trying to put that social mission into some meaningful. So my own view is that this is all about engagement, engagement with communities that aren't tr traditionally associated with the university and help working with those communities to try and um, uh, 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 set different agendas uh, in terms of research and, and policy issues. Uh, and it is very much linked into questions around minorities and participation. In the Council of Europe, their primary primary interest is in promoting democratic culture. Um, personally, I'm a fan of liberal democracy. Uh, I know there are lots of problems with it, but I nevertheless am a fan of it. Um, and so I'm quite comfortable with that, uh, with that, uh, that, that, particular, that sort of particular perspective. But part of the particular rationale around the Council of Europe is to promote democratic culture in post-communist societies, because communism and fascism were the two totalitarian cul-de-sacs of the 20th century. Um, and I think they should stay there. Um, the, uh, uh, they're trying to, to work with the universities in former communist countries to try and promote democratic culture among the students, because a lot of them will go on to play leading roles within societies. But part of what's involved in that is creating a democratic culture within the institutions. And in our institutions, we could do a reasonable amount on that sort of area uh, as well. Uh, so, so for me, that's, it's the, the idea of engagement or not is the first one. And if you accept engagement is important, then the bigger issue is what the nature of that engagement should be and to what extent there should be a progressive social purpose at higher education. Um, and that's what 
the work that I'm trying to do, and that's where I think it connects into some of these sorts of sorts of issues. Sorry, one last final point, but I just remembered. That I, I was very struck by the, the whole discourse around decolonialisation, yeah. uh, in part because coming from from the, from uh, the West, partly coming from Ireland, where people indulge themselves in the conceit that uh, Ireland was the only country in Europe not to have an empire, uh, but quickly sort of allied over the fact that uh, half the British army created the British Empire were and Irish. British yeah. The most, uh, well, but the, <laughs> the um, but but the decolonisation, the, the way one of the ways it was talked about in the seminar, I thought was very interesting, was to look at different traditions, historical traditions, and use them as a focus for trying to re-establish a different sense of purpose. That's exactly what we've been doing in this broader network today. I mean, whether it's looking at John Dewey uh, the, and his uh, role and uh, link between democracy and education, how that can be applied in a higher education context, or Francis Bacon and his argument around the time of the Enlightenment that the purpose of higher education is to do good in society, uh, an argument which was lost very, very quickly as the cloistered university became the predominant sort of theme, um, or the, the civic tradition of the uh, late 19th, 30th, 20th century in, uh, in, in UK higher education, or the land grant tradition in the 19th century uh, United States higher education. All of it is about trying to find a different historical trajectory for the sense of purpose that we, we should have at the present time, and trying to articulate what that purpose should be, and having it informed by um, human rights and a sense of social justice. We're out of time. I know we are out of time, but <laughs> we're not being thrown out here. <laughs> so it's just is that all right? Can we can we try and wrap up but not yeah. Um I was just thinking about what Tony was saying about decolonization and, and sort of looking back at the traditions sort of that have been lost um, to colonialism, for example. Um, I think there's a distinct difference in the South African context in that the traditions you're gonna look back at in that context didn't have a university. I mean, um, there, not that there were no places of, no, no ways of learning or no um, ways of transmitting knowledge, but you didn't have a university, it just didn't exist, right? So you, it's like this weird kind of attempt to um, appropriate or reclaim or transmute ideas and ways of being and ways of doing things and ways of understanding the world that is this big kind of strange disjuncture between the two. I mean one of the things was in at the winter school we tried to do that basically. Um, one of my colleagues um, came up with, a, it's called, the concept called Um Khabulo. Um, it's a Kosa concept. Um, basically um, in a community people would sit around in a circle and they'd pass like homebrewed beer um, and the idea was that everyone must get a chance to speak so you need to be comprehensive but concise because you don't want to keep the drink from the next person right so the sort of idea of everyone having equal sharing um, so we tried to kind of institute it into the winter school as a kind of way of being and a way of structuring certain discussions and I think that that attempt kind of pointed out the difficulties of trying to do that because of how set certain ways of being are in the academic space. Um, also, I think we just had too many people um, that made it a tricky. But yeah, these so it kind of ended up just falling back into a, a, sort of this this kind of standard way of doing things. So I thought that was quite interesting, um, sort of highlighting the challenges of trying to decolonize or intellectualize Af African languages and things, but that there's this, this doesn't really quite fit. Um, or, or maybe just the power of, of tradition um, and, and certain and ways of doing. Of where you were and the constraints of yeah, the Yeah, exactly. That maybe you weren't able to make something with your hands, which exactly. sometimes gets people thinking in a different way, right? Or exactly, yeah. Even, I mean, like, do you know how rare do you ever get to have music as a background for mm. sound, you know, that mm. like, penetrate versus yeah. the presentation format, mm. right? It's, it's like... Yeah, so we needed, I think you need to do something much more radical in terms of disrupting. You can't just bring a concept in. Community. Yeah. Stop us. Mm. So Probably very yeah. useful for exactly. that. Just in a different setting. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, so, so that was quite interesting. Um, Tony already brought up this intergenerational, these intergenerational contestations. Um, 
I think one of the things is that young academics, either who just got their PhDs or are busy trying to get their PhDs, especially black women academics, feel very alienated within the universities. Um, and there's almost like a lot of pressure on them to kind of be representative and to do all these amazing things, but without much support. Superheroes. Yeah, so one of the things that I, f that came out of the winter school for me was the need to try and do, if we do another event or next time we have funding, to try and focus on early career academics, for example, or early career re researchers, to actually give them some support to actually do their research and whatever kind of explore new ways of doing things. Because I think there is a lot of potential there. A lot of these ac young academics are doing really interesting things where they can, um, in terms of teaching practice, um, in terms of research, in terms of mentoring other people. Um, but they're not given very much support, which I think is also where a lot of the anger comes from. Um, I just want to add that to mm -hmm. me, it also seemed that there were politics at play in terms of the older generation. Yeah. And there's a huge amount of credibility you get if you were part of the struggle. <coughs> and um, there, there isn't, I mean, that stuff is untouchable. Um, Except uh, no, but the, but the, the for, students. For, for, younger, for, a, for a younger okay. generation, it's very, very difficult to operate as an equal when you have that, those huge looming shadows of having mm. fought so much. <laughs> so, um, is that kind of like. Um, survivor's bias in a way, it's just mm. like, you yeah. know, the people at the top are like, well, I made it through this institution, this nature of learning, this form of pedagogy and assessment, or whatever mm. it may be, um, so you should do it too. So because they they were able to make their way through that, then they want to perpetuate awesome. that same kind of thing. I think there are the some narratives, there are, are some, are some of the older generation who have no time for what's for, for, mm. the, for the changes that have happened. But there are also those who are literally identify with the resistances they that do, the students yeah. are. Um, but are now vice chancellors. So, so you kind of have to, you have to sort of, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you kind of trapped in the structure as well. One of the things that struck me in that sort of part of the debate school is the um, uh, an understanding of desire for rapid change right now. Yeah. And um, this is about social design. Yeah. Um, and some of the older generation saying, um, implicitly or explicitly, we have changed a lot. You yeah. can't believe how hard it was to change yeah. what we did. You just cannot understand the process of trying to get it from here to there. And yes, it's mm. not as good as it should be, but it's better. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's it's, 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 it's broader about uh, the, sort of the equality of, of conversation. Because one of the interesting issues there for me in an academic work, particularly in disciplinary work, is where is that link into social expertise? Hmm. Because academic disciplines are based on a body of knowledge, um, and the fact that there's a body of knowledge that's yeah, sort of framed in particular ways suggests that there, there are experts, and if there are experts, then that implies that at any particular point, the, not every view is, their perspective is equal. And how do, how do we hmm. frame that into these sorts of things as well? I think it's not an illegitimate hmm. issue of tension to think about. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's also one of the big contestations, yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to just bring up was, um, because the fo this idea was foregrounded in the, the concept of the school was the idea of imagination, I suppose, was I don't, we didn't really do much of like creative methodologies or alternative perspectives from like no, creative fact, disciplines. No, in fact, we thought we really need to do that. Yeah, so um, basically that was like one of the gaps, I think, yeah. in the school. Um, if you're tr going to actually try and reimagine what the university is like, um, I mean, there's other initiatives at our university to kind of reimagine engagement, community engagement, for example. Um, so if you're going to do that, how do you do it? Because um, imaginations of things are so limited because of structural issues and stuff and I think like the creative arts can potentially yeah. be a way of trying to break through those barriers. If anyone wants to come to Norway we're doing a session on comedy as democratizing knowledge oh, as a tool and a vehicle to yeah, break down the ivory tower so, and bring oh, um, the type of knowledge that's within the institution um, to a wider audience. Yeah. Great. Respect and 
Um, so um, I just wanted to add some of my reflections as one of the people that had a sort of intentionality around this event, but this event is a catalyst for something larger. Um, they were very, very different people. Um, part of the problem of having it in South Africa, um, it was put there because it was rooted at, at an historical moment when you don't need to argue for the necessity of a critical position. Almost everybody in the room, everybody walking down the road has a <laughs> that idea. You don't need to argue for the legitimacy of it, but there, but there is a really strong sense that even those who are experts in the area, even those who have worked practically are finding the limits insurmountable and something needs to change. As much as, so, as much as it was important to put it in that place in that historical moment, I think that sometimes it, it overshadowed other discussions. So we had people from other parts of the world who at times be had become si became silenced in the space. Um, and I think some of, the, some of it was literally because we were battling with the, the ruptures of um, discussion of lived experience and the background politics and literally it became all about South Africa, which even now it has just done the same thing, right? Um, and I don't really know how we handle that tension, but that is something that um, probably wherever we would have a network thing, that would be part of it. That place-based thing would emerge and become part of the negotiation um, in a way just as it did in Syria, bringing people together. And, and I, think th I think there's validity there, but there's quite a tension. What, what I did notice was that it wasn't just um, Andre and I bringing together a bunch of people because we thought it was important. It was clearly there that despite the fact that the event itself probably failed in a number of ways, and even though an, a network tapping into other networks might not be that successful, there is a real desire for solidarity across international spaces, across institutional spaces, because there's a necessity for it, because things are, are um, there is change, but it is just really, really difficult to get a sense of it um, and to, to move things along in a quick enough way. Um, and so both for those who are undertaking such studies, but also those who are, who are making such changes. So um, it, was, it was really good to bring together people who are at a government level driving policy in higher education, with people who are transformation officers, with people who are doing curriculum. All of them are saying, we, need, we desperately need this conversation, but we also need a sense of solidarity, that we're part of a project that matters and should be um, affirmed and critiqued, that that is a, a good process. Um, there was un undeniably a sense of impatience, um, a real concern about anxiety. I think that also came across in the, the CARA event too, um, an anxiety that you're going to be on the wrong side of history, <laughs> that what you contribute to will not, will, will not be operationalized in a way that you can have control over. Um, I mean, that is pretty much where my area of research interest is anyway. What is the, what is the um, significance of what one puts into motion, in a sense, when it actually comes out on the ground? Um, but that was really palpable across almost what everybody was sort of saying. Um, and, but also this sense of it was a very critical space. So it was all about the worst parts, right? It wasn't the mainstream space. We weren't celebrating the changes. We were saying it's not enough. Um, we weren't celebrating the scholarship. We were saying it's insufficient. It's, you know what I mean? There was constantly that. Despite all of that, and despite the absolute ugliness of the worst parts of the academy, there was still the sense of a faith that there is something there. Um, and I don't think that many of us yet are able to name what that something is, but there is something in the, the project of the university and its role in social justice. Um, and uh, for me, that was really affirming, you know, uh, because like many of the academics that I spoke to in the hallways and whatever, there was a sense of, we might just leave academia, that we might just have come to the end of this. We can't actually sustain doing this research in these spaces. But by getting together, I think there was a sense of, no, this, this is worthwhile. I can, I can contribute, I can do something. Um, yeah. Um, so we're going to be, sorry, so we're, we're now moving on to we have working groups that have been established and um, we're hoping to put a platform together and then link with a number of different other spaces. Um, so please watch the space. <laughs> 
um, because it was a sort of um, an attempt to catalyze something that would be that would that would try to create a hub across different spaces of research and practitioner space.